Uh, Kirk, you want to leave, let the uh, other participants in? Yep, they're all in. Oh, they're all in. Okay. I just need to get it, the other view here. Hang on a minute. There we go. Uh, good evening, everyone. I would like to call the uh, City Council meeting of July 13th, 2020 to the order. Would you, uh, the clerk please take the roll? Beckin? Here. Johnson? Here. Leo? Here. Lewis? Here. Peterson? Here. Truster? Here. Herb Plank? Here. All here. All right. Next item on the agenda is the approval of uh, minutes of the City Council meeting of June 22nd. Is there a motion to that effect? Chris? Mr. Mayor, um, I'd like to approve the regular City Council minutes meeting of June 22nd, 2020 as provided. Is there a second? Second. Uh, moved by Peterson, Mr. second by Verplank to approve the minutes. Is there any discussion? Uh, hearing none, we'll take a vote. It's a roll call. Peterson? Yes. Verplank? Yes. Beckin? Yes. Johnson? Yes. Leo? Yes. Lewis? Yes. And Truster? Yes. The Motion minutes, carries. Thank you. The minutes are, are approved. On Mayor's comments, uh, I just wanted to mention uh, that we were delighted to see that the National Endowment for the Arts awarded a grant through the CARES Act funding to the uh, uh, Saga Duck Center for the Arts. Uh, we we're delighted to see that kind of support and um, congratulate Kristen and her staff over there for, for getting that. Um, secondly, uh, we just checked the um, Allegan County Health Department and currently they list Saugatuck as having had five cases of COVID-19, Douglas having one. So that's a pretty good record in terms of the folks who uh, would be reported through the health department. Of course, that doesn't account for people who may have been, may have visited us and gone back home uh, and uh, haven't cycled back yet to, to our records. But um, it's a pretty good record for those of us here. Um, just, uh, it, general observation, we were in town today and noticed many, many more people wearing masks, fewer people not wearing masks. It's almost like an exception now. Uh, that's pretty good. And I hope, I hope with the governor's order that uh, that continues. City manager comments? The additional radar speed signs that we ordered arrived today. So the public works department took possession of those and they are prepping those signs to be installed this week. Um, the plan of action for the two signs are to put one on Allegan Street. Um, we currently have one existing sign on Park Street heading, um, I would believe it'd be heading north. And we are going to, at least uh, as I hear otherwise from council, my plan is to put an additional one on Park Street heading in the other direction during this busy time right now. And then we may at some point move that sign um, either to Maple Street or on Holland Street, depending on some of the traffic issues. But we expect to have the, um, the sign installed on Allegan Street um, by Wednesday, Thursday. Public Works has to do brush and leaf pickup, but we definitely will have it up by the weekend on Allegan Street and the Sheriff's Department will work with our crew to find the right location, the other location on Park Street, because we have to have enough um, sunlight to power the sign, but also be in a position that we're going to be able to have the right uh, um, angle to, to um, detect the, the, the vehicles. So they have arrived and we'll be getting them up ASAP. We also um, took delivery of our um, new drop box that we're going to be installing at City Hall on the front door. It's a pretty stealth. Um, piece of equipment where all you will see is on the outside is just a small black sort of area that you'll be able to put in absentee ballots, tax bills, and things of that nature. The nice thing with this piece of equipment is it's secured and it's lockable. So when the um, absentee ballots or the tax bills or anything that gets submitted to City Hall goes into this device, it's locked. 
Um, so only the, the, the staff with the key can, can get the material out and it has a um, mechanism in place so it can't be fished out. So it's not just a homemade kind of device. It was made specifically for this type of uh, activity. Um, so what we're trying to do is um, give, every, give the citizens every opportunity to um, be safe. Um, they can uh, obviously call City Hall, talk to the individuals. They can do Zoom meetings, face-to-face -face Zoom meetings with the staff, or they can, instead of coming into City Hall and being uncomfortable for them as, and also as for staff, they'll be able to um, drop things off um, in a uh, efficient and um, productive manner. So we're moving ahead in that direction on those items. That's all I have at this time. Okay, thank you. Are there any agenda changes to be proposed? Hearing none, then we'll move to guest speakers. And the first being uh, John Moxie, the bridge inspection report. John, are you on? There you are. I am here. Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm going to start with a little bit of history because it's been a few years at least since we've talked about the bridge. I know there's some new faces on council. Um, the bridge dates back to 1937. It was uh, constructed by the DOT in uh, 37. Uh, and MDOT owned and operated it for a number of years uh, until they replaced the deck in 1982. So the deck dates back to 1982. And as part of that deck replacement project, they turned it over to the cities. Uh, you guys got a bargain for it. You got half a bridge for a dollar. Um, so the, the bridge is currently owned by Saugatuck and Douglas, uh, shared basically 50-50 right at the middle of the bridge. Um, as in terms of the inspection process, uh, for whatever reason, Douglas was entered as the lead agency um, for bridge inspections. So when, when you see it, if you go searching for it online, you'll usually see it associated with Douglas, but both cities, uh, we did a legwork and figured out that, that you own half of it each. So uh, we've been operating under that for quite a while now. Um, in 2011, 2012 was when some major uh, improvements uh, got funded by, by uh, Michigan Department of Transportation and Federal Highways. Um, we got a pretty sizable grant to do quite a few things. They didn't really change the look of the bridge, but it was, uh, if you remember, it was restricted to, I think it was 20 or 25 tons because the piers were in really bad condition and they're a unique configuration. So part of that project was reinforcing those piers, uh, which, which was a little tricky, trying to fix the undercarriage of a bridge when the, everything else on top is staying. Uh, we worked on bearings, painting, uh, the overlay on the deck, uh, replaced the approaches, did some lighting, the decorative lighting dates back to that project, and then uh, the timber structures in the channel to protect it, um, dolphins and fenders around the piers. That all dates back to that 2011-2012 uh, project. So flash forward to um, today, uh, the bridge is on a 24-month inspection cycle. That's the maximum allowable um, time you're allowed to go before it needs to get inspected by a professional engineer. Uh, so we just finished the inspection in June. Uh, no real surprises, uh, but it's been eight years since that project. So we're starting to see a few things that are going to need some maintenance. Um, some of it can be done by the DPWs. Some of it is probably going to be something that uh, you would contract out. Um, nothing major, um, but we came up with, you know, things like uh, removing the debris from the joints. Um, the expansion joints allow the bridge to move the steel beams, you know, when, when the temperature gets hot and cold, uh, shrink and swell. Uh, there's debris in the deck drains. There's a series of, of drains, kind of little miniature catch basins uh, that allow the, the surface to, to drain to the river. Uh, those get plugged up, it seems like every year usually. Uh, so those need to be periodically cleaned out so that that can drain properly. Um, the high water level on the river um, has gone high enough that the, the timber um, dolphins out in front of the piers are, are almost submerged and the reflectors sit about a foot below the top. So they're, they're mostly submerged. We've, we've recommended that either we install some higher reflectors or maybe put some reflectors on a post up on top uh, just to, to, uh, to mitigate that high water, make sure that uh, if there are boaters around um, when it's darker out that they'll easily see it. Um, brush removal, that's mostly on the Saugatuck side, um, just keeping, keeping the small, small trees, brush, 
uh, from, from growing up around the structure. It, it hinders the inspection process, but it can also start um, deteriorating some of the uh, slope protection, um, abutments, things like that. Uh, and those, those are the key items that we thought the DPWs could probably take on um, when, when the summer season kind of slows down. Uh, some things to start thinking about hiring somebody to do are, are resealing the joints. Um, there are a series of expansion joints that don't need to be sealed. They have a, they have a special rubber gland in them, but um, the joints on the approaches and some of the other joints on the bridge have just a, um, a sealant in them. And that, that deteriorates over time just with oxidation from the sun and things like that. So it's, it's getting time to uh, replace the joint seals. Um, the bottom surface of the deck has uh, what we call delamination, where um, pieces have started to break free of the, the mass of the deck. And with as much boat traffic as goes under the bridge, we want to make sure that periodically we start looking at removing that material before it, it falls into the river. We'd like to catch it before it falls. Most of the time that's going to happen um, in the seasons where boaters aren't really using um, the, the river. That happens a lot with uh, freeze and thaw, but just to be safe, it's, it's gonna be a good practice here to start uh, trying to have that removed ahead of time. Um, sealing some cracks, uh, both in the concrete and in the asphalt, um, it's gonna be time to do that. And then the light poles um, on the bridge, they're steel poles, they had to be steel because of the high wind loads through there. Um, but with steel poles, you get the strength, but they're also um, susceptible to corrosion, especially with, with the salt that you need to do on the bridge to um, keep it safe. So we've started to see some of that coating on the street lights breaking down and starting to see some corrosion on those. So um, we've started reaching out to the uh, manufacturer to get some repair procedures to, to recoat uh, some of those little areas. Most of the time, it shows up right above the railing. And unfortunately, that's where when you walk on the bridge, that's the first thing you see. Um, so it's an aesthetic concern too. Uh, but those are really the needs uh, that are out there. Uh, happy to take any questions. Um, I can run through photos if you'd like, whatever detail you folks would find helpful. All right, any, any questions, Council? I have a question, Mr. Mayor. Yes, Chris. Uh, give us some time frames. You said we start. We should start thinking about. We should start looking at. Uh, when should we start actually doing it? Yeah, the um, the joint seals. I would say in the next few years, crack seal. Most of these things are in the next. I would say one to three years. Um, the the things that you would contract out for. I think everything else is is stuff that can be done this fall. Thank you. Mr. Uh, Mayor, this is Garn. So, John, I have uh, two quick questions. The first is, so you said this is, we're on a 24-month inspection cycle. So I saw at the, the beginning of this document, you have the regarding colon 2018 routine bridge oh, safety inspection. Does, is that? We have a typo. Yep, I sure Okay, do. just, I, I was a little confused. That. That's what I thought. And then the second was um, on the photo where it shows the hand hole missing cover in Southwest. Um, I walk that bridge a lot. Um, I take the dog across. I think that's it. Oh, you just had it. I think that I remember seeing some electrical wires in there and, and there's also, it's, there's quite a bit of water in there, literally up to the top of it. Um, and I didn't know if that was a problem with lighting or causing the electrical problems. Yeah, I think that's a little bit of vandalism and I didn't put it in my um, list of uh, to-dos for DPW, but I should have. I ended up finding that cover um, on your side underneath the um, bridge, basically, on the slope there. Um, I think somebody grabbed it, um, which it must have take, taken some doing because it, uh, it's a bolt-down style cover, um, but somebody made off with it. Uh, there is no live electricity in there. If you see just okay. to the right of that um, opening, that's where the old consumer's lighting used to be. Uh, oh, okay. So that that doesn't really have any live electric in it, but it's still a trip hazard. So yes, uh, good good point. It definitely is something to uh, to work on before that cover finds its way somewhere else. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Barry. You're muted yet. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. 
Um, yeah, knowing my fellow council people, we don't want to let this just sit and ride, uh, but we haven't budgeted for any of these improvements. So uh, I'm just making a general comment uh, that uh, we need to get some numbers in our hands to start budgeting or adjusting the budget to work on that. And then also it would be a, a split with Douglas uh, but maybe more of the problems are on our side, and that would be our deal. Yeah. Well, how does our deal work? Um, do we not just split the cost of maintenance of the bridge, or or is it literally whatever happens on our side, we're responsible for? It? I don't know. That's a that's a good question. Um, up to this point, it's it's kind of been a split the split the cost fifty fifty. Um, when we did the project back in 11-12, it was a 50-50 split. We didn't try and get fancy enough to break down um, all of the various costs. And it, and it worked out to be you know, roughly 50-52, so that wasn't a bad thing. Most of the maintenance items apply to both sides of the bridge. Um, so from that perspective, I think 50-50 split makes sense. The only one that stands out to me is the, the brush on your side. But again, I think that's something that Scott and his crew can, can probably handle. All right. Good. Any other yeah. questions? Well, that's, yeah, just to follow up then, uh, we, we do need to, I guess I'm asking for uh, getting something together we can budget with and then talk with our friends in Douglas uh, about moving ahead on this. <clears throat> so maybe by next spring or something, uh, we can start to work on it. Yeah, mo most of these are still fairly low cost items. So we can, we can, uh, work with Kirk and, and with Rich across the river there and, and get some budgetary numbers pulled together. Excellent. Okay. Any other questions? Ken? Yes, Mark Kirk. Here. Yeah, I'm kind of interested if Kirk, if Kirk is uh, able to comment uh, regarding if he's had discussions with Kirk or what, how he uh, visualizes a game plan based on the report. Kirk? Yep, I've talked to Rich over on the other side of the river and um, the idea um, was to get the public works, both public works crews together to do the maintenance that Mr. Moxie mentioned that he thought could be done in house. So I'll be working with him and uh, our public works crew. We were kind of thinking after the summer season so that because right now we're just swamped with, um, yeah. with things to do. So um, probably in the fall, we're gonna um, start tackling a lot of these tasks that we can do in-house and, and get that done before the winter. Wow. Okay. Any other questions? All right, John, thank you very much. Very Appreciate the report. Yeah, thank you. Next speaker is uh, Lieutenant Brett Ensfield uh, for the Sheriff's Report. Brett, are you there? Yep, can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. You guys are doing uh, as you spoke earlier about the mass and stuff, and you know, obviously, uh, seeing a large increase in mass usage over the last week or so. Um, so that's uh, really good around town. I would say you guys are among some of the highest, probably in the county, just uh, from driving around, uh, uh, doing other enforcement uh, issues and tasks that I have, um, and be able to see that. Um, there has been an increase in uh, parking complaints uh, over the last couple of weeks, uh, just with, uh, I think, probably the reduced uh, parking in areas and so forth, but uh, nothing abnormal, but uh, in case you guys are uh, starting to hear um, some of the conflicts and stuff like that that uh, um, are getting reported, we're having um, some businesses and stuff called in on uh, different parking items and stuff, so we've been addressing those with enforcement action and, and so forth. Also, uh, we've had a couple complaints uh, early in the mornings of the uh, some boats in the Coughlin Park. Um, had the guys uh, and gals checking on that uh, later in the evening to um, address those and uh, get those uh, taken care of before morning time, um, so they're not getting called in as a complaint early in the in the morning hours and so forth. So, um, also uh, been uh, working with a uh, working with everybody to try to take a look at uh, some of the speeding issues and stuff, uh, preferably mostly uh, you know, up on uh, Park Street, um, you know, directed uh, the deputies to do some enforcement over there um, and in a review with speaking with them from what they're seeing. They're seeing about roughly the average speed rate, uh, right around the, you know, either the speed limit to uh, roughly about 30 miles an hour where they're doing enforcement. 
Um, they've issued a couple citations um, for speeding, and those citations have roughly been in that 35 to uh, high of 36 range. They really haven't caught anybody else uh, speeding in a uh, much higher uh, speeds than uh, that uh, when they have been able to get out there and do some uh, enforcement out there. Um, talk to Kirk a little bit more. I found last year's data where uh, we did download the speed signs. Um, I commend you guys on, you know, having so many speed signs uh, that you do as very proactive and it's able to let us look at the uh, statistics. Um, I, I pulled up last year's. We, we haven't been able to download uh, this year's. We're going to try to hopefully do that uh, this week um, for so far this year. But last year, uh, during the whole summertime, they're roughly from uh, six four to nine twelve. Uh, you roughly had one hundred forty two thousand cars run through there, um, and you know, obviously, uh, if you looked at the statistics of these, um, you know, it shows the max speeds. Uh, what those max speeds don't take in consideration is mercy vehicles going through there. Um, it doesn't take in consideration of, you know, us doing enforcement and having to try to catch up to the vehicles. Um, uh, those could be some of the max speeds that you're seeing and, or just, you know, sometimes the people are driving fast. Um, pretty much what the, uh, uh, what you look at is, uh, you know, the average vehicle speed, if I was looking at, um, this as uh, a traffic person, um, you know, just looking at the raw data, not knowing where it's at. You know, I would look at the uh, average speeds and then probably the 85 percentile speed. That's, you know, usually the normal flow of the traffic. Um, you'll hear that for like traffic engineers and stuff use that for, you know, setting speed limits and so forth. So, um, yeah, that's about it. So we we're trying to do some enforcement action and uh, looking at the data and kind of going from there. So, but, Town's been busy, but uh, I haven't really had uh, any super major complaints, knock on wood. And uh, hopefully uh, you guys aren't getting any negative feedback either. So, Any, any questions of Brett? Chris? Uh, thank you, Lieutenant. You talked about enforcement for the parking. Is that people that are exceeding the three-hour limit or they're parking and handicapped? Yeah, what? That, that, um, we've been getting a, quite a few of the three-hour limits. Um, also, uh, we're getting uh, just complaints on general parking and so forth, uh, you know, just lack of spaces and then, you know, somebody's either creeping over a little bit on uh, another space or just, you know, somebody parks there all day and, you know, over the night and you know, so forth of that type of nature. So just general parking conflicts. Yeah, I bl yeah, I believe we're, we're issuing citations on quite a few of those. So. Okay. Thank you. Garnet? Yeah, Lieutenant Ensville, can you talk a little bit about um, what the Allen County Sheriff's Office is going to do about enforcing Executive Order 147? That's required. Uh, you mean the, the mass? Yes, um, sir. We're, we're, yeah, so pretty much what we're uh, doing is, you know, obviously, um, you know, that has a contentious uh, part of it for the uh, businesses. Um, we had uh, several meetings about that today, um, and uh, what we're looking at is obviously, uh, you know, protecting the businesses also. And uh, so, you know, say uh, somebody comes in without a mask into a business and uh, they have conflict, um, you know, under that order, the business does have, you know, potential uh, sanctions on their uh, licenses and so forth. Uh, so if uh, somebody calls in a complaint and, uh, you know, we'll go address that. And, you know, typically we're, we're going to look at this as a, you know, trespassing issue also of, you know, the business doesn't want to have somebody there. So we're, we're going to look at it as, you know, they're, they're refusing to leave. So uh, it's easier for us to address it that way and take immediate action if, um, to resolve the situation. So. Great. Thank you. Holly. Yeah. Holly. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I had a question um, for Brett and possibly even for John Moxie. It was interesting to see the data from last year on Park Street, it seems like a lot of cars, but I don't really have any context. So um, for uh, such a small road, can somebody give me their opinion for those types of uh, volumes that we're seeing? Well, I, when I saw it, I was surprised that there was that many cars that had gone through there <laughs> for you know that period of time. Um, you know, we, we obviously, at the sheriff's office, uh, you know, we only have two of these signs and we don't leave them up like you guys are uh, uh, for the, uh, uh, 
we, we, we put them up to look at the statistics usually for a week or two at a time. Uh, we'll see where the uh, trouble times are, and then we'll go out and do enforcement off of those uh, things. Um, a lot of times we do, we're getting complaints like, you know, kind of like Park Street. We're getting, uh, you know, I use a section of road down by Glen that we had. That was a 25 zone. We put the sign up. We went down there and actually did some enforcement um, during the time frames of conflict. Um, and, uh, you know, there really wasn't a drastic speeding issue. It was more, you know, relationship to the road. The road is a smaller road. People are in close proximity to the vehicles. Um, you know, so it kind of leads to, you know, people maybe misjudging vehicle speed at a time. Um, but there are definitely was some outliers there. Um, you know, what we found sometimes in the county too is that uh, we had a we have had several roads in the county where people we've you know had complaints on enforce or on speeds. We went out there and did enforcement, and then they'll they'll call the road commission and and uh, either complain about the speeds where the road commission will like look and go, well, there was maybe no speed study done on this road, or we issue citations and somebody fights it to the level where they demand to see the speed study, and they actually either the road is so old that they didn't actually have a speed spot it's already done and the, the stop or speed limit sign was just up there. Uh, so we, there's been a couple of roads where the speed limit was actually raised and, and uh, you know, to a higher speed limit than, than actually what it was before. So, and some of the, some of the kind of interesting issues that do come out of these uh, speed things, but uh, definitely a large, large volume of vehicles traveling down that road. And, and, um, what about uh, density? Is there ish? Is there, from your perspective, uh, from writing tickets or, um, you know, giving people warnings? I mean, unsafe driving, or I mean, that's. I think that's a big problem on Park Street. Is that you have people that are just going too close to people on bikes, or um, they're just not uh, being safe at times. Yeah, I think you have different conflicts there during the different times of year and so forth. So, um, and you've got a lot of different, you know, different types of activities that are trying to be done out there. So, uh, you, know, you know, typically for enforcement, we're looking at uh, change of behavior. So, you know, we're not we're not saying, hey, we're going to write everybody that has, a, you know, five over a, a citation. You know, we're, we're looking to educate, uh, you know, hopefully get word of mouth out that we're out there doing enforcement. Um, you know, and, and try to change uh, people's behavior. Uh, issuing a citation is, you know, probably the last thing that we really want to do. And that's probably the last thing that you guys really want us to do, too. You know, we literally could sit out there and, you know, make, turn into the Ohio Turnpike where, you know, you have the uh, reputation that if you come to Saugatuck, you're going to get a citation. We, we don't, you know, really want to have that when neither, uh, I think, does the community. You know, we, we're, we're trying to you know, balance what, you know, people tolerate for enforcement and or, you know, we gain compliance. So, you know, typically when I worked on the traffic team, um, I, I used for my discretion was, you know, if I told somebody the story and they would, you know, look at and go, you know what, that person deserves to get a ticket. Um, that's kind of what I used as, you know, the my checks and balances was that, you know, I, I wouldn't be mad myself if I got a ticket if I was doing this going down this road. Whereas, you know, you hear sometimes the stories of, you know, I was going too over and I got a citation. That's, you know, probably not uh, the best of discretion I was used. Thank you. Gary. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, all of the council people have received some comments uh, questioning if we have funded our police service at a level that uh, gives uh, your team, Brett, uh, you know, adequate resources to do enforcement. And I said this mm -hmm. I think in the last meeting, and I guess I'm going to say it again, is if you ever feel that you need more resources and you need to come back to us to say, well, maybe it's going to cost you a little more, whatever, uh, safety and lives are more important than money to us. And uh, yeah. if you feel you don't have the resources you gotta let us know yeah i think our day-to-day -day operations and stuff i mean i think we're doing very well i think we're staffed appropriately um you know obviously there's days where we could have you know many more officers um 
you know, and I, and you know, as the, as a year goes by, you know, I, I think this year is a you know a strange year just with the pandemic and you know some of the other um, things that have been kind of thrown in the mix and stuff that you know we obviously have some different uh, you know drags on us that uh, you know we that kind of take priority of you know health and safety and stuff that we need to look at. You know, obviously, you guys did a study where you know you got the business owners and so forth wanted us downtown more, you know, and walking around. So you know, we kind of had focused a little bit on that, and um, you know, we where we are trying to do these other uh, uh, auxiliary type, you know, things of enforcement and so forth. We don't want to let those go to the buy side or anything like that. But there's you know times during the day where you know some things maybe have to give a little bit to uh, uh, you know make things uh, you know flow smoothly and make sure the uh, peace is kept in, in town and so forth. So, Yeah, you know, and uh, you know, I live close to downtown. I walked around this weekend and I met uh, three men, wonderful men. They are reserves that were there. One guy was from yep. Hamilton, guy was from Glen, the other guy said he's from Algon County, but they were walking the beat all night long. And then I was, I was heading home. Uh, Jason was locking up the restrooms, got a chance to talk to him and I, you know, you guys are on the job, and I appreciate it. No, I appreciate it. I appreciate everybody's support, too. So, Chris, uh, you had your hand up. Thank you. Lieutenant, the number you gave, that was for last year, right? The 140, what was it? Yeah, that's, that's last year. That's from roughly from, you know, June 4th, I believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 6-4. That's when we put the sign up until 9-12. I can't remember when we put the sign up just a couple of weeks ago, the sign just got back up and stuff. And uh, I got to wait for Deputy Flockstra to, he's actually the one that has the Bluetooth uh, thing to be able to download the data from the sign. So we're, we'll, we'll try to have those statistics up this week, but mm -hmm. you know, just from talking to the officers out on the street and I've driven down through there quite, quite a bit, just, uh, you know, going out, checking on the beaches and, you know, um, you know, I was down there just a couple of weeks ago uh, doing a, a news story for uh, uh, water safety in front of our police boat and so, uh, so forth for Channel 3 News. Um, and I had driven down there and I did a little bit of enforcement uh, during that time and uh, just looking at it because I know there's, there's, you know, complaints and stuff coming in and I just want to be able to see for myself, uh, you know, what's kind of you know, going on on the street and so forth. So. Kirk, do we know if the beach uh, numbers are up or same or lower than last year, which might give us an idea of the traffic? Uh, beach numbers are actually up a little bit right now, which isn't surprising due to the fact that the other communities that had beaches, um, most of their beaches are, the area has substantially been reduced because of the high water, so. So we can probably- Yeah, and you're, we're, Excuse me, go ahead. And we're seeing conflicts. Uh, all through the county with the uh, higher water with the beaches and stuff. I mean, that's, that is not, the use is way up. And, uh, you know, obviously people are, are, are using these outdoor uh, arenas just because they can't go to the movies and, you know, all the other uh, indoor activities that typically people typically are doing during the summertime are, are seeking outdoor, um, you know, uses. And, you know, our Allegan State Game Area is just, you drive through there and, you know, two years ago, you drive down the road, you want to see a car for an hour, you drive around out there and you can't even drive five minutes out there without seeing a car. So, you know, all the outdoor things are definitely up. So I think we could anticipate that the numbers will probably be similar for the traffic, if not more like I think Jane mentioned last week that she thought she'd seen way more traffic than before. And that looks like it's kind of proving to be true. Best time. Yeah, it's pretty happy then. Thank you. All right. Any other questions? Mr. Mayor, I know John Moxie's still on here and he might be able to just give a little council a little bit of input on some of the um, speed signs and the process on that. I mean, since we have him on here, maybe he could, if he feels comfortable, he could give a little bit of background because it is somewhat complicated. I think people think that we can just, the city can control the speed limit signs and there's a process that we have to follow. Yeah. John, comment? Yeah, I had a couple of thoughts. Um, good discussion so far. Um, first, I just wanted to point out where the traffic counts were taken at, at Interlock in there. Um, so you are picking up all of the Oval Beach traffic. Um, and I think that that uh, it, it is it is a lot of traffic for a fairly narrow road, especially when you have all the competing interests and the non motorized interests too. Um, what this doesn't necessarily account for completely is north of there. Uh, width is even more more of a concern, as as you well know. 
Um, you have a real pinch point at Holiday Hill and then again north of uh, Mount Baldhead Park. We're going to be resurfacing the section north of Mount Baldhead Park this, um, this fall. Uh, but we, we aren't really able to widen it. Based on how the easement is written there, we're putting it back uh, the, the same width as what's there by and large. So um, it's not going to help the width. In terms of signage, um, I know uh, residents have expressed concern that um, the section north of, of Perryman is, is signed for 15 miles an hour, but um, those are cautionary signs. Those aren't uh, regulatory signs. The, the actual legal speed limit up there, believe it or not, is 25 miles an hour. Um, the, the cautionary sign is really just there recognizing the fact that it is very limited in width. You have a lot of uh, uh, sight distance obstructions and, and uh, driveways, things like that. Um, but yeah, if, if there are other questions in regards to signage, I'm, I'm certainly open to them. Any other questions? Dan? Mark? John, you're, you're saying that the, uh, just north of Perryman on Park, the uh, cautionary sign at 15 miles an hour, can that be changed to a regulatory situation? I mean, can council make a determination that at least in the summer season north of Perryman, that should be 15 miles an hour? Kind of interesting, though. Maybe the police having a comment regarding that. Maybe the same thing on Perryman Street itself. Uh, it, just, just curious. Um, I'll defer to the sheriff on that one. Um, I could, I could certainly do some checking with my traffic folks, but I think that 25 miles an hour might be the lowest you can, um, set a, a speed limit for a public road. Yeah, I, I believe that uh, 25 is probably the lowest and that's, and typically I, I, you know, I talked to Kirk a little bit about this. I don't know in the cities how those speed limits are set. I know on a county roads. I would imagine they're probably the same is that, uh, you know, they'll, they'll do a speed study. And uh, literally I was out, it was a County when they did a speed study, they just pick a day out and they sit there with a, with a, one of our police radars and they just count out the cars. And I think they count off like 45 cars and they just average out those speeds. And that's pretty much what the speed limit becomes is, is that. So, um, you know, it's not very scientific, but you know, there's, I've seen areas like uh, I know down by uh, I think it's a 62nd off of Old Allegan down there. That was a 25 zone and that, that turned into a 45 zone um, that, uh, you know, it didn't have a speed study study done on it. And uh, the county uh, did a speed study out there and it, that, that speed limit was raised to 45. Um, there's a road down in Glen also that I spoke about earlier. That was a 25 and that's uh, now a 55. Um, because it uh, reverted back to its own sp old speed limit, so. Yeah, it's actually a little bit higher than the average speed. I think it's it's either 80th or 85th percentile. Yeah, the 85th percentile. They report, report, yeah. they report that 85th percentile. So if, if you were only setting the speed, you know, um, by the book, if there were no other factors involved, it would be a 30 mile an hour um, road. But based on the things like the width and the sight distance and the number of driveways, we are allowed to deviate that from that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks. Any other questions? Gardner? Yes. Yes. A, a couple questions. So I recall um, some conversation about speed bumps in the spring and um, was wondering if those were put back out for the summer and if we can expand upon those um, to help slow people down a little bit. Oh. If we can expand upon those a little bit to help uh, slow people down coming down from the beach, going up to the beach, all along uh, Perryman there. I was involved a little bit. I can speak a little bit north of Park Street. I don't. I don't know that there are any south. Or I'm sorry, north of Perryman Street. I don't know that there are any south of Perryman Street. But north of Park Street, I know there used to be three or four. And there are people on both sides of that issue up there. And I think the compromise that was reached was, was two. Kirk, um, do you recall where, where we landed with that? Yes, the, the council met with the public and um, agreed to remove two of them in the middle and keep two out at the entrance right north of Mount Baldhead. And then also at the area um, just before you enter Oxbow. So we have two on that section of Park Street 
Um, there hasn't been any discussion about adding um, speed bumps or speed humps on any other sections of the roadway. And when we talked to some of the folks at Police and Vanderbrink, um, Mr. Galdus, um, again, there's a, there's different, I guess, different data on the, on the usefulness of, this, of, this, of those speed humps. Some, some studies are showing that they actually increase the speed because when someone has to slow down in between the next one, they speed up. But I'll have to really defer to the engineers on that because I'm not an expert in traffic engineering. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. And I don't know if we looked at them specifically um, uh, south, of, south of the beach, but um, that, that is typically the case where you'll, you, you only are controlling speed at, at a very narrow um, distance around the actual feature. Barry. Yeah, just to give a little historical perspective on this, and uh, John is exactly right, that there were uh, more humps out there than there are now, but there were on people uh, both sides of that debate. And uh, the number two was a compromise uh, that uh, kept the neighbors, uh, you know, not happy, but uh, it was a compromise and that's why there's only two now. Right, more satisfying. Plus we went to humps from bumps. Kirk, yes. is that correct? Well, yes and no. We we didn't put we put the speed bumps out there for this season because we were going to have new ones when we redid the road. We didn't want to we wanted to get ones that were that were when we got the road finished that they would be compatible. So we just used the existing ones for now. But when the road's finished, we'll put the speed humps instead of the bumps after the road is done. Okay. Any other questions? The discussion. All right, well, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Brett, I, I think you've got a sense that uh, council people are, are pretty happy with the sheriff's services and everything I've heard, I've not heard a discouraging word in town about their deputy, I think they're doing a great job. So thank you very much. Well, I appreciate you guys' support, you know, and, and I mean, obviously, you know, we can't do this thing alone and stuff like that. And our guys have, you know, definitely become part of the community and so forth. And we want to see everybody you know, be safe and be successful and uh, so forth. So we appreciate it. Okay, thanks again. Let's move on to public comment on agenda items only. Uh, comments are limited to three minutes. Uh, if you wish to make a comment, select unmute in your Zoom interface and speak your name to be recognized or press star six if you're calling in by phone. Would anybody like to make a comment? Uh, I see John. John, you're raising your hand. I am. Elmerick. All right. Would you please uh, give us your name and where you reside? Go ahead. Talk. Yes, I'm John Helmrich, 3522 64th Street in Saugatuck Township. I'm a member of the Saugatuck Township Board. And I want to say uh, hello to our friends and neighbors in the city. And one of the comments I want to make, which I wrote to you about it's it's not an agenda item so i hope it's okay to just briefly say that you may remember back in february my colleague brenda marcy and i attended a council meeting to invite the city of saugatuck to join a potential joint meeting between the two city councils and the township board and we i just wanted to give you an update we've been talking about this every month at our board meeting and we are still fervently behind doing such a thing. We talked in February about maybe waiting till April or May, and we all know what happened with the, the pandemic. Our feeling is that this meeting to be, to maximize its worth, especially to the public, is that it should be when we are allowed to meet in person and encourage more public participation. So that kind of puts us in limbo right now, as we all know, and we're not sure when we would be able to meet in public and it might be close to the upcoming election. So I just wanted you to know we're still, as I said, fervently behind moving forward the, with this, with our partners and friends in Douglas and the city of Saugatuck. Uh, it could now be a spring issue of 2021, but I just wanted to let you know, we, we haven't dropped the ball on that and we're still very much interested in moving forward with this. My other comment, I guess is, I think it's an agenda item. I just wanted to let you know that the township board is very much of the mind that it might make sense 
to have a uh, either a joint resolution or at least the three municipalities to each adopt a resolution uh, regarding uh, the wearing of masks in our community. Hmm. Thank right. you. Yeah, thanks, John. And, and I look forward to having that, finally having that group get together. It will happen. Idea, but the timing was not so good. <laughs> no, thanks for your patience, but we're, we're not letting that go. Okay, anyone else wish to make a comment? Yes, I'm waving my hand. Uh, Jane, okay. Uh, would okay. you please identify yourself and tell us where you were? Okay, Jane Underwood, 130 Perryman Street, Saugatuck. Um, first of all, I'd like to say I'm glad the council is allowing people to make some comments. I believe I've talked to every council member recently about Park Street and the danger. Uh, you know, we've talked about this for a long time. Some of the council members that I talked to, you know, okay, we've talked about it, but nothing has happened. And this is what really bothers me every year, maybe it's because I'm getting older, possibly, but the traffic is heavier. People are, in some cases, they look like they're manic. The 4th of July weekend, when people couldn't get up to the beach, when they saw the oval was closed, the parking lot was closed, they were just absolutely crazy. I would like to suggest that we have more police Friday, Saturday, Sunday on Park Street, maybe at the bottom of Perryman Street. Because when the sign goes up, the beach is full, people just continue to go up there. And when they come down, they just don't even bother to stop with a stop sign. We have more people walking. We have more people riding bikes, motorcycles. I've seen people with baby buggies and strollers. We need a safe place for people to walk on Park Street. Please, let's address this. One more thing, I did go under the bridge yesterday in my little whaler, and it looks like it needs some work. I've mentioned to several council members that possibly we could give people alternatives when Oval Beach is closed, when the parking lot's full. Let's look into this. Let's be proactive. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Jane. Anyone else wish to make a comment? I don't see any hands raised, so we'll we'll move on then to the next agenda item, which is approval of accounts payable. Is there a motion? Mr. Mayor? Yes, Mary. I'd like to make a motion to approve the bills in amount of $436,978 and 89 cents. Second. Moved by Johnson, second by Peterson, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. To uh, approve the counts payable. Are there any uh, questions or discussion on, on this item? Mr. Mayor, I did have a, um, an email with some questions and I'll quickly um, try to answer them here. Okay. There was a question regarding the High Point Electric flooding uh, item 19. Uh, that had to do with the flood mitigation plan that council approved for the uh, flooding work. We had to install the electric um, to get the pumps and everything running. Uh, we did install an additional um, sub pump down at the Lucy Water Street area and we had some additional billing for that too. So that's all for the flood mitigation work council approved. Uh, we had a, another question regarding the mutt mitt and the mutt mitts. Mm -hmm. Those are the um, Mm -hmm. um, material that we put out into the park that um, allows people to clean up after their pets. <laughs> uh, so we, we, we purchase those and, uh, and um, put those in the parks. The other uh, one was Saugatuck Fire and it was a short-term rental. Um, that's item 
uh, 24, 34, I'm sorry. And that is the, um, the mm -hmm. department does the rental inspections, they bill us and then we bill the, uh, the applicant for that cost. And, and thanks for and thanks for um, sending those questions to me in advance. I, that way, I can make sure I have all the information and get you a good answer. So I appreciate that. Good. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, Gar Just, Gar Gar yep. Uh, so, Kirk, are we still on for July twenty third with Jeff Sluggett? We are. Yeah. It's the. Um, let me double check here. The July. It's actually July twenty seventh would be the next meeting, next regular uh, meeting. Okay. Yeah, we're gonna do we're gonna do it at a regular meeting because we we have oh, yeah. um got it have him on as a guest speaker and then we we also will uh, likely be going into closed session because there's some settlement um settlement um mm -hmm. discussions we have to have so we'll do that at a regular meeting. Okay. And Mark, uh, and either Kirk or I see I don't know if Peter's still on or not. The this, there's a sizable payment to MERS for the. Uh, retirement is that just a, a, a makeup or a catch-up or a, what, what what's what what exactly is that yep. uh, what we're doing with that um, is the um, the unfunded liability which the state of Michigan has required all the municipalities to um, get under control we're we've been taking a very proactive approach on this for the last yeah, I'd say probably about three or four years so that we're way ahead of the game and Peter's done a lot of an, um, analyzing this to figure out where's the best place to park the money. And so we're trying to number one, um, be proactive with the with what the state's requiring us to do and, and take care of that unfunded liability. So I think Mr. Stanislawski might be on here and he can, well, he was a minute ago. Um, I don't see him on here anymore, but that's what that uh, payment is for um, when you see that on that accounts payable. And I can get you some more information in terms of where we are with our current, where we are currently funded. We're actually doing really well. Um, you know, you may have read in the previous years, some municipalities have had to go out and bond, get into compliance. So, so if, you're, if you're not in with compliance with the state regulations, the state will force you to go into compliance. And, and we definitely don't want to do anything that we're forced to do. So we've always been proactive in trying to make sure that we're not in a bad position. Okay. Uh, Garnet? Guard? Sorry, I forgot to lower my hand. Oh. <laughs> Sorry about that. Any other yeah. questions or discussion? All right, then we'll uh, we'll move a vote. Uh, it's a roll call, Cindy. Cindy, you're still muted. Back in. Yes. Johnson? Yes. Leo? Welcome back. Lewis? Yes. Peterson? Yes. Verplank? Yes. Lester? Yes. And Leo? Yes, sorry. Motion carries. I can always come back. It's easy to see. House table are approved. Uh, we have no introductions of org ordinances, no public hearing, or unfinished business. So moving to new business, the first item is uh, the release of restrictive covenant at 655 Spear Street. Kirk? Well, I can, uh, I can uh, just give you a quick overview on this. Um, this is a pretty easy one. The description we had um, in 2008 prior to the city ordinance was amended, before the city ordinance was amended to allow accessory dwelling units. Um, there was a or approval at 655 Spear Street uh, to build a detached garage with an office space above and there was a restrictive covenant deed restriction that was filed with that. Since then the ordinance has changed and the property owner was requesting that that be that restrictive covenant be removed. So this is the action to take place to accommodate that and uh, staff recommends approval and Ms. Osmond is on line here too if you want to ask her any specific questions. All right first <laughs> Barry. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I'd like to make a motion to approve the attached termination of restrictive covenant agreement and authorize the mayor and the interim clerk execute the document and have it recorded with the Allegan County Register of Deeds. In a second. Jane. Jane was a bit first. 
So I'll move by John, it's a second by uh, Replank to um, approve this release of restricted covenant. Any any discussion? Mr. Mayor. Chris. Uh, I was glad to see this. We ha we have the exact same thing at one of our rentals, so it's nice to know that there's a process to get it done, and and uh, I'll know where, where to go next. Thank you. Anyone else? Gar. Yeah. yeah, a quick question just for uh, understanding. Is this did this come through planning commission, or does this was there a reason it didn't come through planning commission? It did not come through planning commission. It did not need to come through planning commission. It's okay. just the removal of the restrictive covenant, and I okay. did send it through our attorney's office. Okay, cool. Any other discussion? Then let's move to the vote. Cindy? Johnson? Yes. Verplank? Yes. Peterson? Yes. Lewis? Yes. Leo? Yes. Bakken? Yes. Trester? Yes. Motion carries. Next item is uh, res resolution number 200713A, fiscal year 2021 budget amendment with regard to the um, sewer and water master meter. Yes, uh, Mr. Mayor. Yeah. Uh, this is um, obviously, as the agenda item report says, is a budget amendment. Um, the City Council back in uh, January 28th of 2019 adopted a resolution agreeing to participate with the constituent municipalities of the Kalamazoo Lake Sewer Water Authority in the master meter project. So um, again, this was done in 2019. Um, we received all the final bills after the budget was adopted. Um, and so therefore it was not factored into um, this budget. The money has been there, it was, it's in the, um, water sewer fund. So the money is, has always been in place. We just didn't identify it for an appropriation in this fiscal year. We weren't sure if we were going to have all the bills back in time or not. So at any rate, all the bills are back in. The project is complete. Um, I tried to put in some additional information there because I know we have uh, um, some new council members on that weren't on board when this project took place. And in a nutshell, the master meter project is all of the city of Saugatuck and, and all the um, constituent municipalities have a certain degree of capacity in the plant and um, it's not unlimited. So you have a, a very designated and, and finite amount. And what this master meter project does is calculate the amount of capacity that is, or the flow that's going into that plant so that the operator can determine how much actual reserve capacity we have or we don't have. Um, and this is a full pool full proof way to do this because it's actually a meter that measures it. In the past, it was done um, just based on calculations. So this one is, is a foolproof um, method and um, the council's already approved the project so we, we, we have to pay the bill. Um, but if we would have had this in the uh, um, budget this year, then it would have been just a, an accounts payable kind of option. So we have to do a budget amendment in order to um, stay true to what the auditors want us to do. So if you have any questions, I know we have two of our experts from the uh, Kalamazoo Kalamazoo Lake Sewer and Water Authority Board on uh, this meeting as well, and they could give you much more detailed information. All right, first is there a motion? Garnet? Sorry about that. Motion to, I move to approve resolution number 200713-A, amending the FY fiscal year 2021 budget as presented. To appropriate, to appropriate funds for payment of the city's portion of work associated with the KLSWA Master Meter Capital Project. Second, Peterson. Move by Lewis, second by Peterson to approve the resolution discussion. And Mark? Yeah, if I can just add a couple of small things. First of all, Kirk's explanation in his paragraph three, uh, it, it's an excellent uh, you know, explanation of what, what, what we're doing and what it's for. Uh, it's right on point. Uh, prior to the uh, installation of these meters, uh, calculation was done off of water bills. And uh, there was a, a, a calculation off of a people's water bills in each community to determine approximation of the uh, 
the uh, amount of uh, capacity that the, that respective community had, that had a 10 to 15% margin of error built into it. Uh, the new meters based on uh, more most recent technology available was closer to 3% or less margin of error. Uh, so it will give a much more accurate reading and understanding of each community's uh, use of capacity versus the allocated or capacity they own in the system. Thank you. Any other discussion? All right, uh, hearing none then, uh, this is a roll call vote. Cindy? Lewis? Yes. Peterson? Yes. Backen? Yes. Johnson? Yes. Leo? Yes. Verplank? Yes. Truster? Yes. Motion carries. Resolution 200-713-A is approved. Uh, next item is the professional services proposal update of the 2005 non-motorized pathway study for the Park Street corridor. Uh, Kirk? Yep, hope, um, I have the agenda item report there. Hopefully that's pretty self-explanatory. Um, back in 2005, the city contracted with police and Vanderbrink to do a um, pathway type um, uh, study for Park Street Corridor. Um, what this would do is kind of narrow it down a little bit more, show some more detail, show the actual proposal where the pathway would go. Up, obviously 2005 was quite some time ago. We need some updated cost and really give the council and the community the ability to look at this, say, what would this look like? What would it cost? What are the impediments? Um, and go from there. So we do have funds. Um, uh, available for this. Uh, I think it would be something worthwhile for the council to have for a planning tool and also for the public to see. Mayor. Mr. Mayor. Uh, Chris first, then Jane. Uh, I move to approve the professional services proposal from Police and Vanderbrink Engineering dated July 7th, 2020 to update uh, the update of the 20, 2005 non-motorized pathway study for the Park Street corridor as presented. Jane? I'll second that. Okay. Discussion. Jane, did you want to yes. make your comment? Okay, go ahead. Um, yes, I think it's really important that we, we know the scope and the cost of this <clears throat> so we can add it to our capital improvement plan. I think this is an important thing. Um, it's also a difficult thing, but I, I think without knowing the exact scope and what would it would look like we really need to have that before we can continue on. So um, I think this is a real important study for um, the council to look at and um, formulate a plan around. Any other comments? Barry and then J uh, Garn. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yes, uh, when we received the, uh, you know, the study back in 2005, scared the heck out of us because it was so darn expensive and, and we just didn't have the funding to do that. But we didn't think out of the box about maybe we got to get a bond or whatever we got to do. But uh, I give a lot of credit to Jane Underwood to keep it on my case and uh, saying, you know, we got to do it. And uh, there's always a way to do it. If we don't have enough money, uh, us, the citizens can raise it. We can pay for it. So I'm very much in favor of this, and I thank Jane Underwood for staying on my case. Stayed on all of her cases. Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah. Guard? Yeah, just real quick, John. I thought I'd, I'd seen this somewhere, but I can't find it in my packet. I, I think, did you propose uh, just beginning, here it is, as far as we would have, can you run this through us? So what we'll be doing, you'd have a, You'd put together a plan, you'd bring it back to council. Please run me through this. Exactly, just because I'm more interested in time frame. What are we talking about in as far as from start to finish? Yeah, and maybe, maybe I'll back up just a little bit too. The 2005 study focused on um, options that meet the AASHTO requirements with, with um, grant funding uh, in mind. Uh, and that really boosts up the cost. They were, they were you know, north of a million dollars. We, we focused on at the time uh, a separate um, trail, uh, like a non-motorized trail. And then we uh, looked at um, bike lanes, either separate or, or 
contiguous with the roadway. I, I think at least talking to Kirk, the, the current um, line of thinking is to try and do some widened shoulders uh, through here and maybe not every single um, foot of the road, um, but you know, work around the obstacles that are there and where it is conducive uh, to, to create you know, a four or five foot um, shoulder, uh, which could be a bike lane, um, de facto bike lane. Uh, but that was, that was the scope we were envisioning, unless uh, there is uh, interest in, in you know, continuing to look at those options and see what the costs are today. Uh, they're obviously going to be more than they were 15 years ago. Um, and there are all kinds of challenges out there from trees to, to hills to you know, um, property owner uh, improvements, things like that. But uh, really, um, we'll be looking to kind of do that in our kickoff meeting. Um, the, the time frame is largely up to the city. Um, okay. it's, it's not a, an involved process. Um, for us, it's really a matter of identifying the conflicts and, and uh, identifying the priorities from the city and, and then coming up with, with whatever options uh, you'd like us to look at. Allie? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, John, I'm wondering if it's uh, possible to also add a second tier. Um, I, I like the shoulder idea, but I'm wondering if we can also look at, um, uh, or, or if maybe this is something that you're already going to do, if we are going to talk about speed bumps, signage, um, second um, flashing sign or just whatever engineering solutions we could come up with just in case uh, widening the road is a cost prohibitive option. Is that something that you usually do with that study or are you just focused on um, just the shoulder widening the road? Yeah, I, I don't think the 2005 study did that simply because they were building so much more infrastructure, but that's a good point. We'll, we'll definitely uh, come up with some options and ideas. Okay. So I guess my question was, will you include options for like a sidewalk or um, that kind of thing? Or is this just going to be a widening of the road? We left it fairly open-ended so that we could gather, you know, what the, what the desire was um, from the city side before we dove in and started crunching numbers. Uh, so if that, if that is something that, you know, you'd like to see, we can certainly prepare it. It would be interesting to see what it would actually entail. There's lots of stories about what it would take to put in a sidewalk, but it would be interesting for the council and also for the residents there to see um, what a sidewalk would look like and what it would entail um, with um, property and that kind of thing. Yeah, my, my um plan just in my head as I was thinking through how best to, to pull this together was, was to kind of do a, a virtual uh, walkthrough of, of Park Street and, and get photographs of each obstruction, basically, anything that would stop us from building a sidewalk. And then we can talk about, you know, this tree needs to be removed. We need a retaining wall here, things like that. So you can visually see this is what the obstruction is and, and here's how it affects the various options in terms of cost and impact and things like that. That would be great. Yeah, I agree. Anyone else? All right, then to carry this motion forward, uh, we'll take a roll call vote. Uh, Cindy? Peterson? Yes. Verplank? Yes. Lewis? Yes. Leo? Oops, sir. Uh, we'll welcome back. Johnson? Yes. Beckin? Yes. Leo? Yes. And Truster. Yes. Motion carries. So the motion is, is approved. Uh, the next is a special event application for the Saugatuck Sport Fishing Association. And with us, I believe, is John Watson, uh, if we have any questions. So, um, yeah, a minute here. There, is there a motion? I'll make Holly? I'll make a motion to approve the Saugatuck Sport Fishing Special Event application to hold the 27th Annual Big Lake Classic Fishing Tournament on August 8th and 9th, 2020. Use a portion of Woods Park to set up a way station table contingent on applicants signing the letter of understanding dated July 13th, 2020. 
Yard. Second. Moved by Leo, seconded by Lewis. Any discussion? Barry. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, it's on a weekend. We have reserve officers uh, on duty on the weekends. And uh, I have uh, no doubt the sincerity of the Sport Fishing Association. I think they're putting six volunteers on site there. Uh, but if maybe one of our foot officers, patrol officers could be walking by it, uh, you know, walking by uh, during that event, that would also help uh, everybody. And we have the opportunity to help that way. Holly? Um, I'm a big proponent of the Salmon in the Classroom program. My daughter participated and I just think it's great to, um, that they uh, get the kids out on the big lake. Um, and I think it's a really good organization. I'm, I, maybe this question is for Mark or somebody who's more familiar with this event, but I'm assuming that as fishermen are coming in, that it's staggered and it's not like we're gonna have 30 people coming into way at one time. I would imagine that, um, you know, it's, it's less of an issue. Sure, um, I, I think John Watson is, is with us on the line. John, would you like to comment? Uh, sure. Um, what we are doing this year is we are setting up two different way stations to comply with the governor's orders. Um, one way station will be uh, at Coral Gables parking lot and the other one we're hoping to be in the park um, so that we, we would cut down on the amount of people that would be uh, around this area. And um, we will definitely um, try to have our people scheduled at different times um, so that we do maintain some kind of assembly um, utilizing the roads and the limited parking spaces that we will have to do the way to, to do the weigh-ins on both days. Thank you. Mark? Um, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Uh, maybe John, I don't, I know at our last workshop, there was a question of, is this like the only tournament going on this season? Are there other ones? I believe there's a series of these events going on up and down Lake Michigan, and maybe John can dwell a little bit on that. Um, under normal years, there is um, seven tournaments that are held in the southern end of the lake and seven tournaments that are, that are held in the northern end of the lake. And Ludington is that, is that dividing point. So Ludington North and Muskegon South are the two groups of seven. This year in the southern end of the lake, um, all the other tournaments except the Saugatuck tournament has been canceled. And so we have had an outcry from many fishermen up and down the lake um, to do everything we possibly can um, to hold this event this year. And um, so that's why right now we are approaching uh, the city council trying to help um, be able to hold the event um, this coming weekend in Ludington. They are going to hold their event um, and they have, um, like I heard uh, talked about here, they have um, employed the uh, police department along with many um, uh, organizations to help them patrol and maintain um, distances and the safety of the event in Ludington this year. So to my knowledge, at this point, there's only two tournaments on the lake and that, that will be Ludington in the north part and Saugatuck in the south part. Uh, Chris. Uh, two quick questions. One of them is, if, if, depending on how the Ludington tournament goes, can you uh, update us on that as to how successful they were uh, at keeping the, the social distancing done and if we possibly need to have uh, more more people there than what we were what you've shown us and then the second thing is a question is there's a isn't there a way station over by the river deli would you not be using that one where the where the charter boats come in would that not be uh an option as opposed to wick park um 
I'm not exactly sure which one you're talking about. Um, you're talking about the river market? Yeah, where the river market is, and I think it's called Lake um, Outfitters. In Big right Lake now. Outfitters, yeah. right. Right when um, you said all the charter boats come in, and I think they weigh way there. Is that uh, not an option? You'd rather do it at the at Wix. We would rather we would much rather do it at Wix because there is a little bit more parking with the you know with the parking lot there, and with my staff, you, you know, we would escort a vehicle in, have them weigh their fish, um, and then take the fish or donate them to an organization, and drive out right away so that we're not um, having people stand around this year. And so what we've done this year to try to help alleviate that is we are implementing what's called online scoring. And um, we're going through training sessions right now on how to do that um, so that people can come and do their weighing, leave the event, go back to their boats or, or their houses and pull up on their computer um, this website to find out how all the boats are doing in in the in each of the two divisions, the pro division and the amateur divisions. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Then uh, we have a motion to approve this application, and it's a roll call vote. Cindy. Leo. Yes. Willis. Yes. Peterson. Yes. For Plank. Yes. Beckin? Yes. Johnson? Yes. And Truster? Yes. Motion carries. So the application is approved. Thank you, John. Mr. Mayor, this hey. is Kirk. I wanted to jump in here real quick if I could. Um, I couldn't unmute myself quick enough. Um, I did want to let council know I reached out to Angelique Jones, who's the health officer for Allen County. Um, so anytime we have things that COVID related, I want to kind of get some input from them. And she said that uh, she thought it was a good idea having these two separate way stations. Um, she just mentioned that she would recommend that the organizers have social distancing markings to help um, for a visual cue. And um, um, if social distancing, hand hygiene and face coverings are utilized as indicated, it would be low risk exposure environment. So she was not opposed to it, but I think anything the organizers can do to to take that additional precautions um, would be helpful. So just want to let you know the health health uh, officer did review this and is recommending those things. Okay. Thank, thank you very much. All right, let's move on then. There is no consent agenda. <clears throat> and now we'll take public comments on any issue. Again, please limit comments to three minutes. If you wish to comment, select unmute uh, the mic in your Zoom interface and speak your name and tell us where you reside and uh, or press star six if you're calling on a phone. Anybody wish to make a comment? Okay, hearing none, we will move to communications. Um, routine bridge safety inspection has been discussed. Uh, there's a sheriff incident analysis report. I don't know if anyone wishes to make a comment with regard to that. basically for our information. And then finally, um, there's executive order 2020-147 masks. Uh, any comments, questions, or discussion about that? There are none, then we'll move to boards, commissions, and committee reports. There's none listed on the agenda, but are there any? Cal Lake? No, we're set. Okay, Garn, we're planning. <laughs> Yeah, real quick. No, I was uh, tri uh, tri community recycling committee met on the 23rd. Uh, we had a very good informative uh, question response session, if you will, with Carrie Rattinger, who is the outgoing soon to be retired Republic Services representative. Uh, he, he was excellent. And Barry was on that um, zoom with us and he might want to chime in. But um, I, th I think my, my belief was that um, his ability to answer the questions, to get them in advance, and to really put some thought into them, uh, I think helped people um, kind of step down, if you will, from being displeased with Republic. He was very personable. He had his replacement on the line, Jack. I can't remember Jack's last name, um, but uh, I felt it was a very productive meeting. Barry, you have anything to add? 
I, I couldn't agree more, uh, Garnett. And uh, it was it was kind of like the handoff too. Uh, the old guard, the guy mm -hmm. Terry, he'd been there a long time. He we didn't stump him, and uh, and the new guy was on, and uh, he's ready to jump in. So we have a very good connection with that whole program, uh, and we'll keep moving forward on that. Okay, good. Um, any other commissions, committee reports? Okay. Uh, then we'll move to council comments. And uh, first, Barry. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I do have one request. Uh, we haven't heard much about the Blue Star Trail in a long time. It's quite a contentious uh, issue before COVID, but I know uh, Holly's on top of that. Maybe at the July 27th regular council meeting, maybe she can uh, give us an update uh, of where they are. And then maybe there's nothing going on because of the uh, pandemic, but uh, I think it'd probably be good uh, for us to all put our toe in the water on that again, if Holly would do that. Um, and I also want to encourage people to use the public comment time at the, uh, well, actually twice every meeting, uh, but at the end of the meeting, it's like any topic. And, and again, we've had some contentious uh, meetings and comments made, and I'm not sure what the problem is. Nobody's come out to say here's an issue that uh, this city council is not addressing or, or what we're doing really wrong. And uh, so I really want to encourage, we have four more months for the election for people to put things on the table so we know uh, what's the thoughts in the community and things we could act on. So thank you. Thank you. Holly? Uh, yeah, I have um, two ideas actually talking to Jane about uh, Park Street and uh, she just uh, was talking about communicating to people that had um, headed out in the morning or in the afternoon with the car packed ready to go to Oval Beach and get there and obviously uh, we're at capacity the parking lot's full and it seems to me that uh, we could certainly just add to the Oval Beach page on the city website. We could uh, give people some tips. Hey, if the lot is full, um, it, it's possible that when you get there, the lot could be full. So you may want to drop off. You may want to plan ahead uh, or you may want to take a moped, take a bike, hit the stairs, um, and we could do the same uh, with our phone recording at the city. Um, as far as Oval Beach, just at least tell people plan. Uh, if you don't get there early, it's possible the parking will be full and these are the options. That alone could decrease some of the traffic. I know, you know people planning for the day are gonna be looking online or making a few calls in advance, so. Just going to put that out there. Good ideas. Garn? Yeah, uh, a couple things. Um, probably questions for Kirk. Um, the other issue that I know is, is coming, I guess I'd like some time frame on that, is the whole issue with the cemetery plots. I know that's coming. Are we going to be discussing that soon? That's the plan. I'm trying to make a policy recommendation. So as anybody that knows how I operate, I do things 100%. So I'm really trying yeah. to put together a really good package as a recommendation to you. So it's not just throwing an agreement to you and say approve it. So um, getting some data of other cemeteries that I can present to the council and make a, and allow you to make a, a good decision. My plan is, um, and I really like to be able to do it in August, but apparently this seems to be kind of more of a hot topic issue. Um, I'm trying to hire a clerk right now. Um, so I'm trying to put all this stuff together so that you can make a good decision. I'm hoping to have something on the 27th in the next meeting, at least for discussion. Um, I don't like to present things when they're not complete. Um, so I'll do my best to get it to you on the 27th. Yeah, I, I appreciate it, Kirk. You, you can imagine, um, certainly no ding on not getting anything from you. I said, you know that we get a lot of comments and emails and notes from folks. So <laughs> um, I like to be able to just say, hey, he's on it. And, you know, stay tuned and I'll let you know as soon as I can. Um, the other item that had come up and again, this isn't anything I expect you to have an answer to, but just a reminder, we had a, a note come across on the Peterson Reserve with the water issues over there. Yep. And um, so I'm just doing my due diligence as a council member. 
And then lastly, um, uh, Holly, myself, Elizabeth Estes, and a group of Sagatuck, Douglas, and Fenville uh, business owners uh, gathered together and purchased 100 signs. You've probably seen them. Please wear a mask, protect our community, protect our businesses. I have seven left. <laughs> um, so folks have asked for them. Um, so if you want one or know of anybody who wants one, you can send them my way. But those have been well received and very timely given the governor's executive order Friday. So that's it. Jane? Um, I have a question about closed session meetings and how those are going to be handled. Are those going to be handled in person or I, I'm really not in love with having a closed session on a Zoom meeting. Right. Mr. Mayor, I can answer that if you sure. give permission. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Sure. Yes. Um, the way that the Zoom um, platform is set up, you can do closed session meetings on here where they have a function that's called a waiting room. So what mm -hmm. happens is we go into closed session. Um, the public is moved to a waiting room portion that they're not um, um, part of the meeting. So when the city council comes out of the closed session meeting, we bring the public back in. Um, lots of other communities are utilizing this platform. It does work. I think what we need to make sure that we inform all the council members is that um, when you do go into closed session, you want to make sure that there isn't, you know, you're at home, you want to make sure there isn't members of your family that can, that are present or can hear. You do want to get into an area that is secure um, and just realize that it is a closed session. Anything that takes place in that closed session is not supposed to be discussed with uh, friends, family, or anybody. So um, I'm confident we can do um, hold a closed session with this platform. Um, this is this is how the world's going to look, folks. So we're going to move forward, and uh, I think we're not going to be changing. So I think we jump in and get used to things. If I felt like we couldn't do a closed session that would compromise mm -hmm. it, um, I'd be the first to tell you. But I think if everyone follows the rules and they know what the rules are, um, I think we're, we can hold a really good closed session and be secure and meet all the requirements. So. I'm comfortable doing it if that helps. Does that help, Jane? I guess it is what it is. Okay, Chris. And, and Ken, Mr. Mayor, can I say one other thing too, just because we're on that topic is I know that um, one of your colleagues over in the, in the township mentioned something about having a, a joint meeting, which I think is a great idea. But I really, you know, I think this idea that we're going to wait until we can get back and the public's going to you know, want to get it back into meeting rooms and meet. I think you have a really good opportunity right now. I mean, we have public meetings that we've had more people on than we've ever had. And I think we've had some meetings, we've had more people in one meeting than we've had the entire year participate. Um, I've participated in, in meetings that I otherwise wouldn't have participated in. So this, this platform, whether you like it or you don't like it, is what the world's going to look like. And if you want to have a joint meeting where you want to really encourage the public to attend, I think if you had a joint council meeting on Zoom and the public could get in and, and, and be part of it, I think you're gonna get a lot more people that are gonna, gonna participate. So I really wanna kind of urge at least the elected officials here, because what we're really doing with Saugatuck government, I'm trying to design this for the way the world's going to look, the way the world's going to be. And I think what we're doing right now is the future. So let's take advantage of it while we can. And the public seems to enjoy it. We have more people, so that's my view. Yeah, I think well said, Kirk. I, I agree with you. Jane, you... Well, yeah, and John kind of talked like this would only be a couple of members from each council. I think the whole council should be a part of this meeting, and, as well as um, the rest of, of everybody else's council. I think uh, one big meeting, especially on a Zoom meeting where it's not crowded, would be a good thing instead of having a couple of people represent everybody on council. So I, I think that would be a good thing to have everybody attend. I think that's a good point um, uh, because it is more practical doing it by Zoom. You're not, you know, you don't have big crowds in a room. And uh, uh, the purpose of the, of the uh, group is to exchange information. It's not to uh, necessarily make decisions or certainly can't make formal uh, legal type decision. So there's no reason why you can't have a broader participation, I think. Good point. Uh, Cindy? I think if you understood John to say just a couple of people representing, he either misspoke or, or was misheard. 
I think the intent always was to have all of the councils and all of the board members at the meeting. Oh, good. Good thing. Okay. Uh, Chris? Uh, yes. <clears throat> uh, I love the Zoom meetings. I think they're fantastic. And the, and the fact that we get so many people uh, listening and they're just so easy to get ready for, um, mm -hmm. at least for me. Uh, ah. I did want to just thank Kirk and Peter and Cindy and Scott and all on his staff. Uh, they have kept every fire that's come up uh, out. They put them all out, whether it was pop-ups or garbage or flooding or anything. I think they've just done an outstanding job. We've moved forward smoothly. There have been no uh, big upsets or uproars. Uh, I'm just very pleased with, with how our staff has done, and I think they deserve a big hand. Thanks. Mark? Uh, I'm good, Ken. Thank you. Okay, I think I've covered everybody. Yes. So we're ready for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Move by Pearson, second by Lewis to adjourn. Uh, it's a roll call vote. Cindy? Peterson? Yes. Lewis? Yes. Leo? Yes. Johnson? Yes. Beckin? Yes. Verplank? Yes. Truster? Yes. Motion carries. Motion carries. Thank okay. you. Thank you, everybody. Good to see you again and uh, look forward to the next one. Okay. Thank you, Barry. Can you wait just a second?